football badges and logos are changing in interesting ways. And when I say interesting, what I mean, of course, is incredibly boring. Either consciously or subconsciously, you've probably already noticed this yourselves. A lot of clubs, at all levels of the game, have had rebrands during the 21st century, and a lot of these rebrands seem to have an awful lot in common. A suspicious amount, in fact. Manchester City, who were taken over by the Abu Dhabi United group in 2008, adopted a new badge in 2016 as part of a broader rebranding exercise, which included the launch of a new website. This was the Citizens' previous badge, from 1997 to 2016, and this is the badge or logo that replaced it. Gone was the Eagle, which was meant to represent Manchester's aerospace industry. Gone too were the three purely decorative stars, which didn't symbolise any titles or trophies. And the club's motto, Superbia in Pro Leo, which is Latin for pride in battle, was also axed in favour of the streamlined new design. Championship side Bristol City's badge from 1994 to 2019, albeit it did get a minor facelift in 2015, is what one might describe as being a classic English football badge. Based very closely on the city of Bristol's coat of arms, just like the club's first ever badge from 1901, it featured a ship sailing away from the water gate of Bristol Castle, scales which represent justice, and two unicorns which, according to legend, would only pay homage to men of virtue. The new logo, by contrast, is uh, round, features only three colours, and the stenciled iconography of a robin. Or how about Yeovil Town, one of English football's most recent rebrands, who earlier this month announced that they will be ditching their current badge at the end of this season, an amusingly terrible but nonetheless iconic and intricate design, again based upon the town's own coat of arms, and replacing it with this, which looks like a stock image, and could belong to any club in world football, were it not for the words Yeovil Town FC being emblazoned upon it in a nondescript font. It's not just English clubs, though. Italian giants Juventus and Inter Milan have rebranded to simplify designs in recent years, along with Fiorentina and Hellas Verona. Nantes have replaced their old crest, which featured lots of iconography with, well, just a big N in League Gun. And in Major League Soccer, a league which is quite frankly obsessed with rebrands, Chicago Fire ditched their old logo for this monstrosity in 2019, before rebranding again in 2021. Meanwhile, Columbus Crew went through four different logos in the space of just seven years, going from one of the strangest and most iconic badges in world football to yet another tricolor roundel that with a few adjustments, namely the colours and the words printed on it, could also belong to just about any club in world football. Nor is it even just clubs. Spain recently simplified their national team logo, going from this to this, and going from seven different colours down to two, and removing much of the detail in the process. Mexico have also minimalised their national team badge, as have Belgium, Australia, Sweden, Ecuador, Costa Rica, Iceland, Kosovo, Gibraltar, Paraguay, Bahrain, Thailand, and even San Marino. Even leagues have got in on the act. The Premier League rebranded from this to this in 2016, La Liga recently went from this to this, and World Cup logos have gone from looking like this to this. Admittedly, the UEFA Champions League logo hasn't changed all that much. In fact, Anyone who can tell the difference between the three logos from 1995 to 2021 only at a glance deserves a medal. Some rebrands have gone down so badly that clubs have been forced into U-turns. You may recall this absolute belter from Everton, which was so despised that it had to be dropped after just a single season. Hull City's 2014 rebrand, which was an exercise in spite as the club's then owners, removed any trace of the club's actual name as they tried and failed to change it to Hull Tigers, was also unsurprisingly short-lived. And this horror show from Leeds United in 2018, which apparently came out of six months of research, 10,000 people being consulted, presumably none of them Leeds United fans, and most of them supporters of rival clubs, and was apparently ready for the next 100 years, but didn't even end up lasting 10 days, due to the backlash from fans. 
So just what on earth is going on then? Why are so many football clubs, national teams, and indeed competitions rebranding? Why do those rebrands all look the same? And why, as a result, is football's iconography becoming so soulless, tedious, and downright sameish? Well, that's what today's video is all about. So sit back, relax, and join me on a journey from Melbourne to Bordeaux as we take a look at the evolution of football badges, the death of detail, and the recent wave of ubiquitous tedium that has washed over the sports motifs like a tsunami of raw sewage. What is a football badge? Well, it's a logo that represents a team and goes on the front of their shirts. That might seem like the easiest answer, but not only is it grossly incomplete, especially in the modern era, it's not even necessarily accurate in its incomplete form. For a start, football badges go on a lot more than the front of match and replica shirts these days. You will find them on a raft of merchandise, athleisure, fashion wear, accessories online in marketing, and all around a stadium. The multiple use cases for badges, or logos now, compared to when they were first designed and even only 20 or 30 years ago, has completely transformed their purpose, meaning, and design. Once upon a time, when a badge was just something to be embroidered onto a bunch of matchday shirts to be worn by players, the remit for the badge's design was extremely narrow, and its importance, even only symbolically, was pretty limited. Throughout the first century of organised football, you didn't really see a club's badge, so it wasn't something that most fans preoccupied themselves caring much about. During the first half of the 20th century, and even into the 1960s and 70s, it was rare to find a club's badge even on the front of their own matchday programme, one of the few forms of club-specific media which existed at the time. That's not to say that there was no iconography at all, it just didn't tend to be the club or their opposition's badge. Here is a Manchester United programme from the 1950s, for example. As you can see, no Manchester United badge from that era, which looked like this. Here is the programme for the 1961 European Cup final between Barcelona and Benfica. Again, featuring neither of the club's badges, and just in case you still didn't believe me, here is a Liverpool programme from when they hosted Ajax in the European Cup in December 1966, which, again, doesn't feature anything that even remotely resembles the Liverpool or Ajax badges at the time. This was the case, it is worth bearing in mind, for the majority of the history of football. These were simpler times, and most clubs, as in the case of the recently replaced Bristol City and Yeovil Town badges that I displayed during the introduction, simply adopted the coat of arms of their home cities, towns or villages. This includes some of the biggest clubs in the world. FC Barcelona's first badge, for example, looked like this, making it an almost direct replica of the City Council of Barcelona's coat of arms, Liverpool's first badge, adopted in 1892, had an almost direct resemblance to the Liverpool City Council coat of arms. The Manchester City Council coat of arms was reflected both in Manchester United's badge from 1902 to 1940 and in various Manchester City badges all the way up to 1978. And the Atletico Madrid badge, still to this day, features the same motif, namely the bear and the tree, as one will find on the coat of arms of Madrid, which dates all the way back to the Middle Ages. As football clubs began to forge their own independent identities, and their badges began to become more prominent and take on new meaning, we saw a huge divergence and diversity of designs, though often inspired by the prevailing art and design trends of the era. So badges at the start of the 20th century were often influenced by the Art Nouveau movement, followed by the rise of the Art Deco visual style which emanated out of Paris, influencing the logos of the likes of Arsenal, Bayern Munich and Real Madrid during this era, and then came the international typographic style, which was particularly prevalent in Europe and represented a much more radical wave of rebrands and redesigns. Out went a lot of the local coat of arms and Latin mottos associated with many clubs' badges since their inception, and in came much more modern designs, stripping away a lot of the Art Nouveau intricacies and often replacing them with a single symbol or image. AS Roma ditched their traditional logo of a wolf, which on their current badge, I always thought looked more like an elephant, 
with its young suckling on its teats, along with text and a shield, and replaced it simply with the stylized head of a wolf, Sheffield Wednesday dumped their old badge, which is also their current badge, which is relatively intricate and detailed, and replaced it with a stripped back and ultra simplistic drawing of an owl without a shield or crest of any description, and a lot of clubs, including my own, retain the iconography of their old badge, in Hall City's case, a bizarre yet brilliant interpretation of what a tiger looks like, but removed everything other than the animal or symbol itself. Even more common, as in the case of Chelsea, Everton, and, again, my own club Hull City, was the strategy of basically doing away with a logo or badge altogether, or at least making any effort to design one, and instead just embroidering your club's initials onto the front of your shirts. I have given a handful of examples here, but I could go on for days, as almost every club underwent a major rebrand during this era. Among the most interesting, or at least reflective of the broader trends in design and subsequently football at the time, was Leeds United's two short-lived badges between 1973 and 1977. Having initially gone down the same route as everyone else of just printing their initials on the front of their shirt at the beginning of the 1970s, and what can only be described as having a Sheffield Wednesday badge before that, Leeds adopted a badge that came to be known as the Smiley. The badge makes out the letters L and U, though only just, and if you didn't know the club's name, you would be unlikely to clock it. Which is perhaps why from 1977 to 1980, the smiley was amended to feature a round shield which also included the club's name in a more easy to read font. The smiley was typical of the 70s revolution of badges, and the disregard for tradition and sentimentality that came with it, with a hyper focus on aesthetics. Personally, I love a lot of the football logos from this era that seem to epitomise what we might now term a retro aesthetic. Though, specifically just in the case of Leeds' smiley logo, as soon as someone points out the bell end, you never really unsee it. I'm afraid it was ruined for me, and now it has been for you as well. Alright, let's move on. Following the era of abstract badges, there was an almost equally rapid return to tradition. During the 1990s, many clubs returned to something resembling some of their earliest badges. Just using the same examples from earlier on, AS Roma reverted to type, bringing back the suckling teat wolves, their initials and an emblem. Sheffield Wednesday went back to something very similar to their badge from the 1950s and 60s. Everton basically went back to their old badge from the 1930s through to 1972. And Hull City, well, look, to be quite frank with you, I'd really rather not talk about it. We all make mistakes, all right? And that is where we were at the beginning of the 2000s, with a lot of traditional, if slightly more polished badges, often featuring lots of symbolism, intricate, decorative, and ornamental details, and several different colours. It is perhaps going from that era of facelifted traditionalism rather than the more abstract logos of the 80s and 90s that makes today's minimalism seem so shocking and soulless to a lot of people. And while it is a new design revolution that has been brought about in part by a change of function, the purpose of football logos has shifted radically in recent years. As with trends throughout the last 150 years, it didn't happen in isolation. Football logos tend to follow trends rather than set them, and that is especially true of the current raft of rebrands. Football clubs, and certainly the top clubs, who seek to market themselves globally rather than locally, regionally, or even only nationally these days, now view themselves as brands just as much as they are clubs, if not more so in some instances. Yes, Ed Woodward and the Glazers, I am looking at you. But Manchester United are not the freak outliers or pariahs you may think, or that they are sometimes portrayed as being. As football has become more corporate and commercialised at an ever-accelerating speed, we shouldn't be all that surprised to see logos and imagery which reflect that fact. The shift towards ever more minimalist and instantly recognisable branding has taken the world of design, at the corporate level at least, by storm in recent years. When you think about it, the rebranding of Burger King and Brentford, Kia and Verona, or Warner Brothers and Seattle Sounders really aren't all that different. 
In all six instances, the brands involved have stripped back detailing, simplified the core design, or implemented an entirely new simplified icon, and reduced the number of colours. In all six instances, the motive or logic is also the same. They want simpler and more instantly recognisable iconography to strengthen their marketing and branding. It's just that people tend to have much more attachment to their football clubs and the imagery that is associated with them than they do to Burger King or Kia. So when they rebrand, there is a lot more emotional investment in it. Ultimately though, much as we may wish or believe that football is different to McDonald's or Sony, in the eyes of those who own the sport, it really isn't. That's probably one of the reasons why German football in the Bundesliga, where the 50 plus 1 rule ensures that, with only two exceptions, fans still have a great deal more authority when it comes to how their clubs are run, and the corporate decisions they take than clubs in England, Italy or France for example, has seen far fewer rebrands in recent years, and practically none which follow the exact same blueprint that has infected every country and league where private and state ownership reign supreme. Bayern Munich basically still have the same badge that they had in the 1960s, Borussia Dortmund's badge has barely changed since 1919, and even Bayer Leverkusen, one of the Bundesliga's two 50 plus 1 rule exempt clubs, have hardly changed their badge in almost 30 years now. Likewise, fellow nominally or meaningfully fan-owned clubs throughout the world have also tended to retain a stronger sense of their identities and that is reflected in their logos. Whether that be Rapid Vienna in Austria, Real Madrid and Barcelona in La Liga, or most of the leading clubs still in Argentina and Brazil, albeit that is starting to shift now with the latter, since new rules were passed to encourage foreign investment. For those outside of Germany and other fan-owned clubs though, the march towards dull uniformity has been incessant. In many ways, Arsenal were the first club to go down this route. In 2002, fresh off the back of winning a Premier League and FA Cup double, Arsenal ditched their decorative crest, which they had had in some form since 1949, and replaced it with something radically different. Out went the ornamental detailing, black letter typography, and the coat of arms of the Metropolitan Borough of Islington. Meanwhile, the famous Arsenal cannon was switched from facing east to west to pointing from west to east. The latter was actually due to a copyright issue, another frequent issue relating to badge design, which can prompt rebrands, along with the symbolism of entering a new era. Rebrands are particularly common at clubs within the first few years of an ownership change, as new regimes implement their ideas of how the club should be marketed, and look to distinguish themselves from that which came before them. In Arsenal's case, having had a relatively unchanged badge for more than 50 years, the rebrand was timed to coincide with the Premier League's explosion in worldwide popularity, the broader modernisation brought about at the club by Arsene Wenger, and in anticipation of moving to the state-of-the-art Emirates Stadium in 2006, which was already under construction. There was another motive though. According to Dave Harrison, who worked for Insign Badges at the time, Howard Wilkinson, who also designed Leeds United's new badge in 1998, had a very clear idea in his mind of the type of branding that he wanted to create. Speaking to The Athletic in 2022, Harrison stated, quote, He wanted something that was more of a logo, something more easily identifiable. He said to me, The cannon is Arsenal. The tick is Nike. That's what he was thinking. He wanted something that jumped out instantly. End quote. It is in that sense, more so than the copyright issue or new era symbolism, that Arsenal set the tone for what was to come. The Nike tick, evoked by Wilkinson, is among the most instantly recognisable brands in the world, but all sportswear brands have tried to create extremely slick, refined, and distinctive logos over the years. Whether that be Adidas, whose three stripes feature on virtually every single one of their products, Puma, whose logo requires little explanation, Reebok, Umbro, Castor, Fila, Kappa, Under Armour, New Balance, and, of course, my personal favourite, Le Coq Sportif. The same is true of the most iconic and instantly recognisable brands outside of sports, whether that be Apple, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Google, Facebook, Instagram, Mercedes-Benz, Ford, Volkswagen, Rolex, Mastercard, Domino's, Amazon, heck, even the website or app that you're watching this on, YouTube. 
One of the most interesting examples, when put side by side with the revolution in football branding, is Starbucks, who were founded in 1971 with a very detailed drawing of a siren, not a mermaid to be clear, who only have one tail, while sirens tend to have two. And if there is absolutely nothing else that you take from this video, then at least let it be that but have, through three different iterations, simplified their logo up to their current design, created in 2011, which has no text, no borders, next to no detail, and only two colours. Is that really any different to League One side Derby County who, just one year after Starbucks, in 2012, and I'm not suggesting that the two are directly related, also did away with the text, border, and detailing of their former badge while retaining the same central motif, and if you compare it to their former badge, up to 2009, also reduced the number of colours present from three to two. Technically speaking, there are no colours in the Derby rebrand and only one in the Starbucks one because black and white aren't colours of course, they're shades, but you get what I mean. I mention that only because I know that there would be that one guy rushing to make that point and correct me down below in the comments and I refuse to give him that satisfaction. Not today Tariq, better luck next time. When you think of Nike, Adidas and Puma being the model, most football club rebrands, even when unpopular with supporters themselves, become much easier to understand. Athleisure has absolutely exploded in recent years, becoming the fastest growing category in fashion, and football clubs are looking to cash in. Whereas replica shirts used to be almost the sole cash cow for clubs, along with the occasional training top here and there perhaps, now you do well to find an item of clothing that hasn't been emblazoned with your club's logo on it in your club shop. Clubs, therefore, are no longer designing logos with the sole or even necessarily the principal consideration of how it'll look on the front of a football shirt, but on hats, trainers, hoodies, tracksuits, sweatshirts, water bottles, and just about anything else that you can think of. When it comes to branding and marketing in sports, essentially, everyone wants to be the New York Yankees, whose insignia is probably the most recognisable in world sport, despite baseball enjoying only a tiny fraction of football's popularity, and many people who wear Yankees emblazoned baseball caps or other items of clothing, having little to no interest in the Yankees themselves. Probably the best example of a football club trying to replicate the Yankees is Italian giant Juventus. In 2017, Juventus underwent a very expensive and high-profile rebrand, ditching a logo that had been synonymous with the club for over 100 years in favour of something completely different. Unlike with a lot of modern rebrands which are accused of being either boring or soulless or both of the above, like Manchester City or Hellas Verona, Juventus's rebrand didn't take inspiration from any former Juventus badges. Never before had Juventus been represented simply by the letter J, and in fact, even during the abstract and psychedelic rebranding era of the 1970s and 80s, never before had Juventus' badge not featured a zebra of some description so closely associated with the club's colours and one of their nicknames, and never before had the club's badge not featured the word Juventus itself. Most Juventus fans, and football fans more broadly, given the fact that Juventus are such an iconic club, hated the 2017 and updated 2020 rebrands, and yet, marketing gurus, designers, and brand strategists adored it. At the same time that Juventus fans were calling for the club's old badge to be reinstated, the new logo was winning awards at branding and design conferences. It spoke of the disconnect between what fans want, which is typically some kind of imagery or symbolism that means something to them and that speaks to the club's heritage and tradition, and what marketing executives and brand consultants want, which is something simple, minimalist, and instantly recognisable. The end result is the erasure of colour, the removal of text, flat and distinct colours being favoured ahead of gradients, fewer shadows or 3D effects, and zero tolerance for anything floral, ornamental, or decorative, often with a wanton disregard for nostalgia or meaning. Football club badges used to mean something. They were packed full of symbolism and nods to the club's own past. Some still are. The Liverpool badge, for example, features the famous Shankly Gates outside of Anfield, 
flames which symbolise remembrance for fans killed in the Hillsborough disaster, the club's full name, year of establishment, and a liver bird within a shield. Except, of course, that while that is still officially the Liverpool badge, you won't find any of that on the front of the Liverpool shirt or on almost any Liverpool merchandise. Not now, and not at any stage, for the last 10 plus years. Since 2012, Liverpool, just like the New York Yankees, have had an official team badge or logo, which is this, and then their own separate insignia, which looks like this. The New York Yankees official team logo likewise looks like this, a little bit less recognisable than the insignia that's actually displayed on their uniforms, iconic caps, and other merchandise. To be honest, I'm surprised that this isn't a route that more clubs have gone down, a sort of rebranding by stealth which would allow for more marketable insignia on branded products, up to and even including replica shirts, without doing away with a logo that might have a lot of emotional attachment to supporters. I see no reason, for instance, why Juventus couldn't have retained their old logo or something very similar as their official team logo whilst using the minimalist new J design on most of their branded products. That includes, of course, must-have items like Juventus Adidas Gazelles, Juventus Bucket Hats and Literal Ice Buckets, and, who could forget, the unmissable Juventus Guframini Cactus, which was recently reduced from €279 Euros down to an absolute bargain basement price of only €199.99. I jest, of course, but Juventus's commercial revenue has more than doubled since their 2017 rebrand, meanwhile matchday revenue has also increased. Despite Juventus going from being serial Serie A title winners and Champions League finalists to finishing 7th last season and failing to even qualify for Europe. That is why, though Juventus's rebrand may have been unpopular with supporters, it hasn't deterred other owners, chairmen and executives from going down a similar route. For some clubs, they are able to have their cake and eat it. PSG, for example, are among the most marketable brands in world football, and the Qataris haven't had to rebrand the club's logo, at the risk of potentially upsetting supporters in the process, in order to create simple and instantly recognisable branding, which can seamlessly be integrated onto almost any product. The PSG badge features the iconic symbolism of the Eiffel Tower, which is Paris, France, and possibly even Europe's most instantly recognisable landmark. The club has a massive and highly successful fashion and athleisure range, and a unique partnership with Nike allowing them to use the Nike Jordan branding on their shirts and merchandise, sometimes replacing the Eiffel Tower on their badge with the famous Jordan watermark. The end result is a global brand, with superstores in New York, LA, Tokyo, Seoul, Miami, Vegas, and even London, which I find quite frankly remarkable, but hey, it's 2024 Alfie, get with the times, and merchandise sales that make a tangible impact upon the day-to-day -day operations of one of the richest and highest spending clubs in world football. Less successful, it would be fair to say, was the attempted 2020 rebrand of fellow French outfit Bordeaux by the club's new American owners, who, in their eternal wisdom, changed the club's logo, removing the word duh, presumably on the assumption that it didn't really matter all that much, so that Bordeaux's new logo no longer displayed their name or even made grammatical sense in French. Great work, General American Capital Partners, you absolutely nailed it. Following the trend of clubs rebranding to herald the dawn of a new era, West Ham changed their badge from this to this in 2016, when the club moved from Upton Park into the London Stadium. The Hammers went down the very well-trodden path by this stage of minimalism and creating a more template and simplistic shield, but whilst others have stripped away text, West Ham actually added the word London to their badge, despite the fact that it isn't in their name, has never been in their name, and has never previously featured on their badge. It would appear to be a pretty brazen attempt, in addition to moving into the London Stadium, that was once the Olympic Stadium, to market West Ham as the quintessential London club, and to capitalise both upon London being one of the world's best known and most visited cities, and the fact that, almost unique among football-loving super cities, there isn't a single professional football club with the word London in their name. 
If you think of Paris, New York, Los Angeles, Madrid, Moscow, Sao Paulo, or Milan, that makes London relatively unusual. Though I'm not sure how much success West Ham have had in entrenching themselves as the London club, ahead of Arsenal, Spurs, or Chelsea, or how one would even gauge the success of such an attempt to be entirely honest. Personally, I think that the old West Ham badge was infinitely better than the current one, but I suspect that I'm not the target demographic. It's not just branding on merchandise that clubs need to think about when it comes to their logos anymore, though. Increasingly, it is how they will exist within an online sphere. Whereas once, you wouldn't even find a club's badge inside of their own matchday program, now they're everywhere. They are on league tables, Google searches, video games, news websites, and on social media. They're even sometimes in YouTube thumbnails. One of the reasons, it has been posited, why so many clubs have adopted roundel logos in recent years, rather than more complex shapes or shields, or traditional crests, is because they make for much easier avatars and profile pictures for their social media accounts. Meanwhile, the fondness for bichrome designs, or at least significantly reducing the number of colours present in a logo, is because it makes them much more adaptable, particularly for online use. I am familiar with this problem myself, just from designing my own thumbnails. Sometimes, a logo just won't sit right on a certain background, typically due to there not being enough contrast between the two colours. Almost all clubs now, however, have either black and white or colour inverted logos. The Spurs badge, for example, can come in black, white, or blue, the Juventus badge is just as recognisable in either black or white, and Liverpool's insignia, unlike their actual badge, is incredibly flexible and adaptable depending on its purpose at any given moment. There's also the more mundane motivation, though it is very much a secondary or tertiary one, that simple logos with fewer colours and less intricate patterns and outlines can be cheaper for manufacturers to mass produce on hundreds of different pieces of merchandise, keeping costs down and increasing profit margins. I could swear that I once read a report on manufacturers leaning on clubs to alter their badges, or at least create more template insignia for their kits like Liverpool, for this exact reason. Though, I have been unable to find said article for this video, and after consulting clothing designers and executives, I am told that the added cost, at least for big clubs, is likely to be negligible these days. It is important to note, as I have alluded to a few times throughout this video, that though the very corporate and slick logos that we have seen arise in over recent years might seem soulless and boring, many of them, though not Juventus's or Bristol City's for example, are based upon old designs either from the pre-war or abstract eras. So Manchester City's post-2016 logo is very similar to their badge between 1972 and 1997. Burnley's new badge is, well, it's literally their old badge, just bichromed. And even Aston Villa's controversial recent rebrand is basically just a modern interpretation of the club's logo between 1973 and 1990. In isolation, there isn't anything necessarily wrong with any of them, nor are they especially tedious or soulless in of themselves. It is the uniformity of it all, the sameishness of it, every club having effectively the same exact rebranding exercise, that leaves a sour taste in their mouth. The best example of this, in my view, is the logos of the various clubs owned by the City Football Group, the world's largest, richest, and most powerful multi-club ownership model. Each of these logos, in isolation, may be fine, but knowing, as we do, that they are all owned effectively by the United Arab Emirates, and they're all just cogs in a hyper-corporate machine, somehow they become emblematic, ironically, of a deeper sickness in football, and the slow death of an authenticity and resonance that the sport once had in spades. These things are all cyclical. We saw that with the history of badges from the 1800s through to the late 1990s. And as trends and broader movements in fashion design and in business shift outside of football, the sport will naturally follow suit. That has always been the case, but the purpose of logos, their use cases, and the people who own the game have all changed with inevitable consequences that have perhaps only just begun. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as ever for watching. 
Hit the like button if you enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And of course, goes without saying, make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for both this channel, HITC7s, and also my second channel, Alfie Pot Sama, both of which should be about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might fancy watching after this one. You can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, or threads via the username at HITC7s on all three, should you wish to do so. And uh, all of those links, plus a whole lot more, should be down in the video description below. Cheers.